Good. Obviously, a lot of the um, parents will be rejoining us, so uh, don't be worried if you see people, various people moving around. Right, we started into <clears throat> this series in the second book of Samuel. Going to carry on with that this morning. I'm not going to recap all the way back because that would take too much of the time. But of course, if you wish, it is all available and can be uh, downloaded so that you can catch up and listen to that. May I also explain that we're not approaching this like a uh, a simple systematic working through because we're approaching this as something that God is using to speak to us. And therefore, rather than just pick up all the facts and who beat up who and who killed who, all of which is, you know, it's interesting, but it's not central to what we're, what we're doing. We want to pick up the things that God is saying to us because He has chosen to actually speak to us through uh, his word. And that's what, <clears throat> that's what we're interested in. But it gets a little bit difficult. And this week is a little bit difficult because um, you really need some context of what we're doing uh, in order to understand what's happening. So what I'm going to do is kind of give you little summaries and then we'll kind of dive in on the on the things which to us at this time are more significant. So we got through a good part of chapter 2, 2 Samuel chapter 2 last time, talking a lot about uh, blessing and uh, experiencing the importance of inquiring of God and uh, the ability to call blessing upon people. And uh, then we get into the, we didn't really have time to get into it, but the sort of um, stuff about all the fighting and killing that's going on. What, uh, the things I want us to look at today is, um, firstly, I'll give you three things. Firstly, we want to see how important it is to trust in God's ability to, to deliver, to, to, to actually do the stuff. Secondly, the issue of oneness or unity being vital. And thirdly, the fact that God is God. And uh, he just does it his way. And uh, you can't really, you can't program God. You can't sort of categorize. You, you can't sort of come up with an equation that if you add this and this, you get that. It just doesn't, God doesn't do that. In fact, every time we try to do that, God kind of remembers he's God and jumps up and does a God thing and throws everything into confusion. So we, we can't go that way. So there's this battle going on between essentially the house of Saul and the house of David. David is king in Judah, but the rest of the children of Israel are basically under Saul. And they have various schemes and do various things to come together. This is one of the most bizarre things. Uh, they come together around a pool, and uh, by this time, um, the kingmaker... If, how about if we do it like this? Uh, Abner is like chief of the baddies, and Joab is chief of the goodies. But does it work like that? You know, goodies and baddies... Yeah? Yeah, all right, okay. All right. So Abner is also a kingmaker, and he, he's made um, the son of Saul uh, now king. So um, uh, Abner, commander of Saul's army, taken Ish-bosheth, some great names as well. No, I mean, nobody's ever named their kid Ish-bosheth, have they? Not yet, no, no, all right. So he's made him king and they come together and then um, 
they, the two sides meet together across a, a kind of pool. And somebody comes up with the idea saying, okay, um, let's have 12 of the goodies and 12 of the baddies uh, represent us and we'll come together and fight as a kind of representative fight. Uh, it didn't get very far um, because when they came together, uh, each man grabbed his opponent by the head and thrust his dagger into the opponent's side and they fell down together. So it's an amazing thing, isn't it? I mean, you've got to have synchronization there. You, you've got the opponent and, and you, you're each lined up. Rich, oh, you're all wired up, aren't you? Never mind, that's all right. This is plain, this is not for real, all right? And you each grab the head, right? And you've each got a dagger, and at the point of go, thank you, Richard. Oh. <laughs> he, he got a little bit too much into that. <laughs> you've got to ask yourself, what the heck is the point of that? I mean, did you hope somebody was going to miss, like England taking penalties, you know? <laughs> it, was it the equivalent of a, of a sort of penalty... Shootout, I mean, I don't know. Anyway, I just moved on quickly. Uh, so this battle carried on and, and uh, um, there was various pursuits and, and there was this interesting situation uh, where they were pursuing, um, Abner was being pursued by one of, the, one of Joab's people and he said... You know, you keep chasing me. Go do something else. Uh, and he's, no, no, I won't. So then he turns around and kills him. It's a kind of weird stuff. But you've read all this, haven't you, already? You really don't need me. Because you all did what I asked you to do, and you went away and read it, and you've understood it. In fact, you could really explain it to me better than I can explain it to you. I find it confusing. <laughs> That's why I skip it quick. So, it's interesting that what we see, by the way, a little thing, I'll just pick out something, this chasing somebody, you could say he was persistent in chasing, but he was persistently wrong. And we have to understand that persistence is good, but if we're persistent in going in the wrong direction, it uh, leads us to serious trouble. It's not just... Uh, well, uh, it's not a quality simply on its own. And so uh, this battle went on and different fightings and they had a little truce and uh, a little discussion. Anyway, and let's kind of skip that. Chapter 3, the war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Basically, there is a, a progression that's going on uh, and it's really not going in the favour of the house of Saul. And the interesting thing is that all this fighting goes on but the outcome is resolved by something even more strange and bizarre. And uh, we see that uh, in, chapter, in chapter 3 where there's some uh, discourse between Ish-bosheth and Abner about uh, was, he, was it okay for him to have taken one of his father's concubines. By the way, that was, that was kind of a political move, not just a sexual thing, it's a political thing. So uh, anyway, that upset Abner. Remember, Abner has the power to make kings or destroy them. And so he then does a deal and goes over to uh, David's side and uh, makes, again, really, has the same power to make David king. It's very interesting that Abner addresses the children of Israel, the house of Saul, uh, in verse 17. He says, um, you know, it's amazing how, how cunning and, and crooked these things are. He says that Abner conferred with the elders of Israel and said, you know, for some time you've wanted to make David your king. They've been fighting him tooth and nail. 
You know, it's just amazing the manipulative power. Uh, now do it. For the Lord promised David, and this is the leader of the army that has been attacking David and, uh, and the um, house of Judah. Uh, now do it. For the Lord promised David, by my servant David, I will rescue my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. And so they come over uh, basically to, uh, to David's side. And David receives them uh, in, a, uh, in a, a good and positive way. Uh, and they have a feast and um, yeah, the thing goes ahead very well. Now there's a little side thing here that I'll just skip through very quickly. Um, Joab... Uh, and Abner have a little sort of uh, altercation and um, end up dead. Uh, so, you know, you might be the commander, but you can still end up dead. So, uh, it's interesting if you, you know, you like the battles, just carry on and read it. Um, and uh, it's interesting to see how David's willing to receive people uh, without recrimination uh, as they recognize that it's time to come into line with what God wanted. So, uh, Joab has murdered Abner and uh, we've kind of skipped through that a bit quick. I'd like to just take you to zoom through to just the end of that chapter 3. The king said to his men, do you not realize that a prince and a great man has fallen today? And he's referring to the commander-in-chief of what was basically the enemy force. You see, David was consistent in respecting and honoring even those that were uh, against him or had sought to do him harm. He wasn't in the business of recrimination. He wasn't in the business of resentment. Or revenge. And you begin to see some of the key qualities uh, of David coming through in many of these situations. Things that, that it's there, remember, the Bible tells us that it's there as an instruction for us. God speaking to us through weird stories that happened thousands of years ago. And instead of rejoicing over the fall of his enemy... Uh, he is lamenting and uh, calling the people to lament. And then, although the enemy has fallen, he says in verse 39, and today, this is David speaking, though I am the anointed king, I am weak. These sons of Zariah are too strong for me. May the Lord repay the evildoer according to his evil deeds. That's God's business. He's a recognition of weakness. Right? Isn't that interesting? Just at the time when the whole of Israel has come together, when from the outside he's as strong as he's ever been, where he recognizing the calling of God and the anointing of God, then he declares, but really, I'm weak. He recognizes the strength of the enemy. And what, what is this all about? He says, I choose to put my trust in God, in the fact that he has anointed me king, not in the fact that I have this strength, or this success, or this recognition, or all this army, or the fact that the people have come over to me. I choose to trust in God. And I choose to leave revenge to God. And I recognize that there is a strength of the enemy, but even in the face of that, and in the face of what is, if you like, on the positive side, I still choose to trust in God. Now, I want us to get this. See, he's seeing the strengths, and he's trusting in God, as well as seeing the weaknesses and trusting in God. And this brings us right back to the revelation of poverty of spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus said, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Poor in spirit is not about how much money you've got. Poor in spirit is if you recognize outside of God, outside of his empowering, we don't have what's necessary. We don't have uh, what we require for life and godliness outside of God. We have it with him. I can do nothing is another sound scripture. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Very significant very important. Well, we've got Israel coming together. They have basically been engaged in civil war. And uh, tribes against tribes is really civil war. And yet, they had, and this is a sad thing, they had the same goal. Both houses had the same goal. They were both charged with uh, clearing out the Canaanites, overcoming the enemy. And yet, instead of concentrating on that, they ended up fighting together. They were instructed, if you remember, to settle the land, to settle in the land, not to fight each other. So they diverted from their essential purpose into fighting each other a sad and desperate situation until along comes David and he won't change his position and he will honour the enemy and he won't carry on this strange and awful uh, vicious circle. The kind of thing that we have stood for. We've just been hearing from PJ about uh, Sierra Leone and one of the most significant factors there uh, over the years, particularly during the Civil War and after the Civil War, was the whole attitude of uh, violence followed by revenge, followed by violence, it's just a kind of vicious circle. And uh, there's only one thing that breaks that, and that is choosing to go God's way, choosing to forgive. And that, that is more powerful than fighting. You say, weird? Yeah. More powerful than fighting. Uh, but you have two different views. I remember um, Richard and I, we were doing a, a meeting up at, at Kingsway. And uh, because of his um, being very well known, he brought people together right across the sort of Sierra Leone community. And there was one factor that was still sort of hell-bent on revenge, and another factor that recognised that unless we stop this vicious cycle uh, with forgiveness, then we're just going to end up carrying on like this forever and destroying ourselves. Well, that nearly ended up in a riot uh, in this meeting because uh, the strength of feeling between the different factors. But let me say again, after the love of God, the issue of forgiveness must rank as one of the most powerful forces in the universe. And uh, I remember, again, I've probably told you about this before, uh, in the early times uh, in Sierra Leone, uh, lots of rebel activity was continuing. And uh, I don't know why, but I was speaking about forgiveness. I gained a big company of people, and I opened it up for questions at the end. And this lady stood up, and she's saying, are you saying that I can forgive that man that I see every day that killed my child? I said, no. It's impossible. What I'm saying is, if you choose to do it, God will enable you to do the impossible. And then one after another, people started standing up with the same sort of questions. Real life, actual questions. And actually what they had to say was far more powerful than anything I could have said because they were talking out of the experience of the power of forgiveness. And we live in that. We live in the good of that. And we live with the ability 
to actually engage in that rather than to be involved in this whole revenge thing, which is fed to us constantly. It's, it's the standard material of many novels and films uh, that it's all okay. You do whatever you need to do in order to get back at the baddie, the person that did wrong. Uh, till in the end, it gets you <coughs> and your own sort of emotions, your own soul, to actually want uh, murder and destruction in, uh, in order to obtain this revenge. It takes you in an interesting but wrong direction. So we have uh, Abner um, has made them king, but he's come to a bit of a sticky end. And uh, David being consistent with his position. Chapter 4, I'm kind of running on a little bit. Ish-bosheth, son of Saul, heard that Abner had died in Hebron. When he heard that, he lost courage and all Israel became alarmed. Essentially, that's because his confidence, his trust, his faith was placed in man, not in God. Uh, he was confident of Abner and really just missed out constantly because of that. Whereas David, of course, as we've just looked at, he was confident in God and his trust was in God. Now, if you read through this, there's another interesting uh, story, but, um, you know, it's, a, it's about creeping in, pretending you're going to get some food and then, uh, and then killing Ishbosheth and... Um, what I couldn't understand when you read through this they crept in while he's asleep killed him um, pretending they were going to get some food chopped off his head and walked out again now presumably you've got to go equipped for that haven't you I mean it's one thing to slip in but to walk out with somebody's head recently chopped off I mean if you have any answers to any of that, I'll be interested. But So anyway, that's, that's where they got to with that, and that, that kind of finished that. Uh, so, we came through to uh, through chapter 5, and uh, we kind of, uh, well, we've skipped one or two things. We've skipped a very sad story of... Uh, when, when they wanted to kind of reunite uh, and the deal was being done, uh, David said, yeah, okay, the deal's there, but you've got to let me have Mikhail back, who was his wife, uh, who was the daughter of Saul. Um, and so they said, okay, all right, so we're going to get Mikhail. And there's this sad story of Mikhail's now present husband following her up the road, crying. Until Abner said, I'll go home. And he just went home. I mean, what is that there for? I mean, what, what a strange story. Other than, of course, it illustrates that we're looking at people as possessions rather than as partners. Uh, we're not looking at two becoming one. We're looking at a mentality that you own so many cattle, so many wives, so many concubines. It's basically the mentality of possession rather than partnership. And in all these things, as we link things together, we can see the importance of having the right disposition, the right attitude uh, before God so that we're accurate within his purpose. So, chapter 5. All the tribes of Israel came to David at... Hebron, and or Hebron, um, we are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel, 
and you will become their ruler. This is what everybody understood that God had said, and this is what's coming to pass. There's, there's quite significance in, in Hebron. Hebron becomes the, the place of transition, moving from the, 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 the broken, divided nation into a unified nation. It's a place of birthing, the place of, of the purpose of God coming forth. It's a place of covenant where they came into a compact or covenant together. The joining of the tribes, the, the oneness, the unity, the, the coming together, the recognition. And interestingly, it's a place where there's a, there's a coming together in the purpose of God. It's like... Uh, a church being unified, a people being unified, coming into a place of significant position for God's purpose. A place of government, a place of rulership. See, it's vital that we understand we start from a place of community. That God's first instruction is we love him and then we love one another. So the issue of relationship, the issue of community, the issue of loving one another is central and critical. But it's not the end. It's not the end of the story. It's not, oh, so you can have a nice little time and a nice group and you can all um, look after one another like a sort of, um, I don't know, Christian version of Rotary Club or something like that. Uh, it's basically with a purpose a purpose of rulership, a purpose of government, a purpose of influence, a purpose of being a people who were taught to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth, here, in Good Mays, Ilford, Barking, Dagnum, Tottenham, wherever it is, your will be done as it is in heaven. This is a place of, 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 from a basis of unity, from a basis of relationship, coming into this place of of government, a place of rule, a place where we begin to take up issues that concern us in our community, issues regarding the hospital, uh, where things have to change, where we engage in governmental prayer to see things change, where God equips us and calls us with a responsibility first to love him, then to love one another to show what he's like, but then to move into that Hebron position the position of rulership, of government, of actually bringing God's rule, of praying in your kingdom come, your will be done, of having essential purpose in the earth. But if you lose the first or you lose the second, forget the third because it's not going to happen. It simply doesn't work like that. So they come into this place and there's no recrimination against Israel there finally coming over to him. They're in this place called Hebron, very, very significant uh, as the true structure of God. That which has been prophesied is beginning to come to pass. That which God spoke of is being worked out in real life. A people uh, uh, with a power or, or power to lead people out, to bring them into the purpose a joining of the tribes together in the true structures of God, not false structures, where there's a, an activation, not just an information, where there's a doing, not just a knowing, where there's a practice, not just a theory. Very significant and very important. So, where are we? Chapter 5. All the tribes of Israel came together. Hebron, we had this. All the elders of Israel come to David, uh, made this covenant, this compact with them. And David's 30 years old when he became king. And uh, he reigned 40 years. I often wonder what it would be like for me when I get to 30. I'm looking forward to that. No, I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying where I am, but I'm looking, for, <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. You know, that... Might be symbolic. Yeah. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem. This is verse 6. To attack the Jebusites who lived there. 
The Jebusite said to David, you won't get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. They thought, David cannot get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, or Jerusalem, the city of David. And on that day, David said, anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind. He's turning the phrase back on him, who are David's enemies. That's why they say the blind and lame will not enter the palace. And David took up residence in the fortress. I just need to explain to you a little bit about the, the situation here so that we understand the significance. Basically, Zion, or Jerusalem, was on a high ridge between uh, Benjamin, which was Saul's area, and Judah, which was David's area. It had been seen as neutral, and it was occupied by this tribe called the Jebusites, which was a Canaanite tribe that should have been cast out, that should have been got rid of. But they were never expelled. So there was a, an area there which had become acceptable, um, was allowed to continue, but it was in disobedience to what God had instructed. So, you know, they've been here a long time. They've always been here. They're not causing any trouble. Um, you know, they're just here. It's just where they occupy. But it was in disobedience. Uh, the Benjamites had never driven them out and the enemy had been left there. What I want us to understand is that the enemy left there, no matter how uh, innocuous or how, uh, um, how normal it had become, became the very area of battleground. In that crack, in that gap, where the tribes were not joined together, the enemy ends up taunting the people of God. You can't get in here. You see, the problem was God's purpose had ended up disjointed. And where there's a disjointing, there's an entry point for the enemy. I want us to catch that. I want us to understand that. It was a small area of disobedience. It was something that had been left unattended to. But it was contrary to what God said. And it became in that gap, in that crack, in that area where there was not the proper joining together, it became the the weapon or the area that the enemy used to taunt and to seek to object to the, to the children of God. You see, right through the scripture, we understand that the importance of unity, of oneness, of dealing with division, of uh, not allowing it, not just kind of accommodating it, uh, is completely contrary to what God wants. He will have a people that are joined together where there are issues that they are resolved, uh, not where it's just an accommodation is made. Because if we don't do that, then there becomes an open, a crack, a, a place where the enemy can take advantage and we cannot possibly afford for that to happen. So, God is bringing his people to his place. Does it in his time? Uh, that's, I suppose, why David doesn't have to be recriminating at all. He's resting in the fact that God will do it in his time. And then there's this strange business of the way it's done, uh, David says, you know, we, if we, to break in here, we'll have to go uh, via the water shaft. It's a kind of secret place where no... The water shaft is basically the lavatory. It's like the sewer. Uh, you know, it's... 
uh, how can I describe this for people of sensitive disposition? It's not the place that you'd really want to be. You certainly wouldn't want to be going in via the water shaft because you'd have to be facing all that was coming down to greet you. Think of sewer without me having to be more graphic. Uh, up to your neck in muck and bullets would be one of the ways to describe it. Uh, it was unexpected. It was a secret place. It was not where you would expect uh, the, the attacking force to come. But David saw that through this place there was a point of entry. And he used that point of entry uh, in order to uh, achieve the victory on that day. And uh, uh, it, was, it was quite an outstanding victory. So they enter via the water shaft and uh, it's interesting that we begin to see that as a result of that, people who are not involved with the children of Israel, uh, people who you could say were not kingdom people, began to help. And I'm looking, um, I'm jumping down. Uh, verse 9, David took up residence, uh, became more and more powerful. Then verse 11, Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons, they helped build a palace for David. Basically, this is now non-kingdom people engaging in building the kingdom. People who weren't of the house of Israel actually joining in and, and bringing favor and bringing help into that situation. Some phenomena which we face these days, which we can't necessarily explain, where we see that the kingdom is sometimes extended by people who would not be kingdom people, but God would still use them. And we have seen that happen on a recurring basis. David, of course, is secure, verse 12, and David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom <coughs> for the sake of his people. He can be humble and powerful at the same time because he knows that God has secured it and secured him. So just quickly moving on from that, uh, the Philistines heard that David had been anointed, this is verse 17, king over Israel, went up in full force. So David does what we learned from earlier on. He has learned to do. He thinks, oh, I'll suss this one out and decide what to do. No. He inquires of the Lord. Verse 19. <coughs> he inquires of the Lord, shall I go and attack the Philistines? Remember the second part of the question we looked at before? The first question, easy, but it's important to ask the second question as well. And he does it again here. Remember how he did it before? He does it again here. Will you hand them over to me? Second part of the question. Very important that we ask the first question and the second question. We don't grab the first and go racing off helter-skelter. We basically wait and get the second one as well. And the Lord answered, Go, for I will surely hand the Philistines over to you. So David went uh, to baal Perazim, and there he defeated them. And he said, As waters break out like a dam bursting, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. So that place was called baal Perazim. When we come together to pray, when we're praying for breakthrough, when we're praying for a transformation, I want us to keep this in mind, especially when we come Tuesday, that we are praying to the God of the breakthrough, the Baal Parazim, the one who turns the thing around in sometimes dramatic, significant, and powerful ways. If we were just <coughs> excuse me, following a kind of, I don't know, good belief system, we would be on our own. 
But we're not. We are servants of the Most High God. And as we do what he gives us to do, we can expect the full extent of his power. So we come together. We came together and prayed in that situation in Sierra Leone. There was a dramatic turnaround. A bow prism. The, the dam was broken. The, the, the workings of the enemy were swept aside. I want that to form our thinking as we come together. David was celebrating. He said, wow. Wow, I did what God said. He said he was going to do it. But boy, do you see what's happened? Now, flushed with that success, he has a second opportunity. Once more, the Philistines came up and spread out in the valley of Raphael. So David inquired of the Lord. He said, and, and this time the Lord answered, no, don't go straight up, but circle round behind them and attack them in front of the balsam trees. Very specific. And that's what we want. We want to hear from God. That's why when we pray, we are speaking and listening, so that we get specific direction, prophetic understanding of his purpose, and we engage together in partnership with him. Because that's our, that's our part. We haven't got to kind of get on the right side. We haven't got to get holy, because... We're already holy through Jesus. So we're brought into partnership. And that's a fun place to be. Because we can engage in projects and purposes and issues like this. Actually engage in seeing the kingdom of God advance. Because we're partners. But of course we need to hear. Need to get the instruction. Need to get it right. So he says, uh, don't go straight up. See, he could have said, right, I know I had to do this. Uh, did it quite recently. You know, you just go out against the Philistines, whacked a lot of them, and, and you're laughing. No. He said, I will not depend on my previous experience of God. I will not depend on the kind of way God did it before. I will hear what God is saying now. Because where does faith come from? It comes from hearing. And in order to hear, we've got to catch what God is saying. So he depends again and demonstrates that dependency on God. He says, don't go straight up. And he says this, he said, as soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees. Now, I, I don't know what balsam trees are. And I don't know if the wind blows through them, it sounds like marching. Uh, somebody can re research that and, and tell us. But whatever it was, there was a certain sound. When you hear that certain sound, that is my signal to move, to go in the timing and purpose of God. Uh, very, very important. It's very key that we live in this realm of hearing God and catching what he says, particularly being prepared for the second question. Abraham heard God but failed to go for the second question. He heard that God was going to make him the father of nations but instead of inquiring again he set the thing in motion himself. That's why today we've still got Israeli and Arab conflict because of him doing what he decided to do not asking the second question. It could work the other way around. There's Paul in the Acts of the Apostles and he's in Bithynia or he's wanting to go to Bithynia and he keeps on asking the question and he's not getting an answer and he will not move. He knows what God's already said but he's now into a specific. And in fact, while he's waiting there is when he gets the call to go to Macedonia. If he'd have gone on according to his own course, without asking that question, he would have missed it. I can remember really bogging up big time by failing to ask the question. I had to confront an older relative and I got what I needed to say, but I didn't get the timing. And it actually, some of these things you learn the hard way, 
And because I didn't wait on God to get the right time, the second question, yes, I know what you want me to do. I didn't stop to say, when do you want me to do it? It took me a long time, years, to actually recover that situation. Not that I was wrong in confronting, I was wrong in the timing. Because here I was, got the word, whoomph, didn't ask the second question. Very important. Of course, as they uh, move forward, um, the opposition increases, and that's what tends to happen. I think we probably need to to wrap it up there so we can come into a time of worship. Um, we'll just finish with the end of that chapter. As soon as you hear, as soon as you hear, as soon as you hear, when you get the word, when you get the signal, that's the time to move. And how to move? Read with me a little bit further in the verse. Move quickly. Do not faff around. Basically, Get the word and go. Move quickly. Because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. So David did as the Lord commanded him and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Giza. Same question, different answer. A quick response to what God is saying. Question. Question. You thought you was going to get away with it, didn't you? Question. Could you make a quicker response to something that God is saying? Go away with that one. All right? Once God has spoken, how quick is your response? And remember, I'm just looking here. Sound of marching in balsam trees? God can use anything. God can use anything. Remember he spoke once through a donkey. God can use anything. He simply does it his way. So, where did we start? We're saying we're looking at trusting in God's ability to deliver his way. Of course, we're enhanced in our ability to trust as we get to know him better. You know, the closer you are to someone, the better you know someone, the more you can, can feel confident to trust them. The vital necessity of unity, that oneness, leave an area that is, is just a little crack between, enemy can use it. And thirdly, God is God. He does it his way. Yeah? Let's come back.